Well, thank you very, very much. Um, New York Power Authority is one of the, um, we have a new partner in Ascend. We just started that relationship at the end of the summer. Uh, we're actively working with them and many of the staff here today, so it's been a real pleasure to meet everyone face to face as opposed to beyond WebEx. Uh, we're hoping to have our system up and going by November 17th. That's our drop dead date that we're all working real hard on. Um, and so far, from what I'm seeing, I think we're likely going to meet that. Um, here to tell you about what we're looking for, some of the challenges that we face. Some of those challenges are unique. Uh, some of them are similar to other uh, problems that you fo fo folks face. Um, but uh, let me just tell you a little bit about NIPA. Um, I want to talk about some of our assets, talk about uh, those generating assets and how they play in the New York ISO marketplace. Uh, we want to talk about how we want to model all of the assets. And then we want to try to make informed decisions based on that. Instead of just looking at it from an individual generation standpoint, we want to move to more of a portfolio standpoint. A little background on us. Uh, the Power Authority is a, um, our mission is basically a power economic growth and competitiveness of New York State. Um, we are a state authority. Uh, we want to maintain and invest in energy infrastructure across New York State. We want to provide low cost power to uh, businesses and customers all across the state, uh, be it Fortune 500 companies to being small uh, retail uh, type of establishments. Uh, we want to also implement energy efficiency pro improvements, uh, solar, EV, uh, wind. Um, so we want to be a major player. Um, as I said, we're a, a political subdivision of the state of New York. We are not a regulated utility, so um, Many of you other utilities here are regulated by your public utility commissions, public service commissions. Uh, we don't have that one. Um, but we don't receive any tax revenues either. All of our re revenues come from the sale of, the, of our generation. If we're building anything, we're going out putting out a bond, and we're using the revenues from that uh, generation to help pay off that bond. Uh, as I said, we serve wholesale customers across New York State under many different programs and rate structures. Oftentimes what happens is um, the power authority is tasked by our governor to do something. So we get approval from state legislator, legislature. Uh, we put in place a program to serve Western New York uh, economic development. We put in a program to serve some other part of the state. It all is uh, politically driven. Um, we're a participant in the New York ISO markets. Those markets include energy, capacity, uh, all the ancillary products, uh, as well as uh, transmission congestion contracts. Just a brief little timeline on us, uh, where we started. Um, key to fame is back, uh, Governor Franklin Roosevelt has created us. Um, we didn't really do anything, though, but you know, 20, 30 years later, we finally built a power plant. Uh, it tells you about the political maneuverings of New York State. After he became president, he used the same model for NIPA, and he established the TVA, that public power. Uh, over the years, we've added on. And this kind of just gives a timeline of all the uh, projects we have in place. We have many different programs, as I said. Um, on the far right-hand side, on the top right, is our latest one called Recharge New York. That's an economic development program with 455 megawatts from Niagara Power Plant and 455 from the St. Lawrence Power Plant. And then we mix in the same value of uh, markets purchases to try to help businesses grow maintain in New York State, and remain in a competitive uh, advantage. It's about jobs. In terms of our generation assets, we're scattered all across the state. Um, top left is our big one, the uh, our Niagara Power Plant. Um, I'm going to go into a lot more detail on that one. Uh, almost 2,700 megawatts. Um, our capacity right now is 2,400. Then we have the St. Lawrence, 800 megawatts, run a river. We have a large pump storage plant in the Catskills, 1,100 megawatts. Um, then we have a bunch of small hydros scattered throughout the state. Small hydros are a bit of a challenge because um, the first need is not always electricity. And sometimes it may not even be electricity until you get to number three. Number one might be navigation. Number two might be drinking water. And then number three is finally electricity production. So that makes for a challenge in optimi optimizing those assets. 
Down in New York City uh, and on Long Island, we have uh, fossil fuel plants. We have two uh, combined cycles in New York City. We have a, a smaller one out on Long Island. And then scattered throughout the city, in the graph on the bottom right, picture on the bottom right, we have our uh, LM6000s, uh, GTs, quick start gas turbines. We also have transmission throughout the whole state, uh, ranging from 765 connections up to Canada to bring down Hydro-Quebec power to uh, 345, which is really the backbone for New York State. I'm not going to go into this too much because the transmission is really a, uh, we receive our revenues under a FERC approved tariff. We have a revenue requirement. We have a rate. So that's basically set. Uh, not too much risk on that one. So the risks that we're working with Ascend on are our hydro volumetric risk uh, from the water from the Great Lakes, small hydros. We have uh, price risk, um, energy prices, natural gas prices, um, capacity. Um, in New York State, they call it unforced capacity, UCAP, uh, just because that's the name. Um, a future risk that's out there is the development of renewables, uh, wind and solar. Uh, that's really creating a lot of issues in New York State. Um, we also have our generation capability risk. Will that generator run? New York has a, uh, a two-part uh, uh, settlement process. You have your day-ahead markets, then you have your real-time markets. They have a rule in place that if you sell capacity, you then have to offer that generator into the day-ahead markets. So if you have a generator that has a commitment, a day-ahead commitment, let's say 400 megawatts, it's uh, very hot outside, the generator trips offline, now the generator has to buy out his position, and typically when it's hot and the generator trips, prices are going to skyrocket. So now you're buying back at super high prices. Um, the day ahead market closes at 5 a.m. for the next day. So in all essential purposes, it's really a two-day market. So when something bad happens for two days, you're, you're sucking wind on that. Um, so that's a generation capability risk. You also have just your basic operations, effective forced outage rates, those you sort of can manage, they're not too, too bad. But when you have those big problems, a three-month outage, uh, now your effective forced outage rate, instead of being 2.1%, uh, balloons up to 30%. And you'll have to live with that probably for the next year and a half, two years. So that's a, a major risk for us. The other risks are uh, enterprise risk, which is just you know, maintaining your, your assets, maintaining your transmission infrastructure. I'm not going to focus on that one. It's kind of outside of our ballywick here. Uh, the last one, though, reputational risk, also I'm not directly charged with, but it's something you've got to be aware of. Um, we serve, uh, a few slides ago, I showed you um, all these retail customers we have. These customers exist because we're providing them cheap electricity, uh, whether it be uh, the Alcoa smelters in northern New York producing aluminum, um, you know, building powertrains for various uh, automobiles. They're relying on that low-cost power. If we go ahead and put hedges in place to try to maintain those prices, we don't want to have happen what that happened down in Florida, where those hedges become deep out of the money, and the customers could be purchasing electricity cheaper, but because of our hedges, now they're paying a lot more. So that's a reputational risk that you want to stay on top of. We don't want that to happen. Um, I put a couple of slides up here to, to, to speak to that we are a public authority, uh, report to the governor. We don't want any reputation issues. <laughs> When our CEO calls, it's not a good story. Um, take a deep dive into our hydro assets, the large hydro assets. These two uh, push pins over here, uh, that's the Niagara power plant and that's the uh, St. Lawrence power plant. They receive their water through the Great Lakes. Um, what we did here is we want to say the Great Lakes are huge, they're like mini oceans. It takes time for the water to move through it. Um, so what we said here on the bottom, if three inches of water were added to one of the Great Lakes, this is the number of months it would take for half of that water to make its way to the Niagara Power Plant. So Lake Superior, 41 months. So you know, it kind of shows that the Great Lakes have a lot of memory for us. So when we're developing our forecast looking forward, um, of course, we're relying on information coming from, um, you know, the uh, uh, NOAA, uh, Great Lakes Environmental Research Laboratory, 
uh, the Detroit Army Corps of Engineers, and then because the Great Lakes uh, span into Canada, we're also relying on information from Environment Canada, all the various listening posts coming in telling us how much rainfall there is, how much snowpack there is, how much ice cover there is on the Great Lakes. Ice is good and bad. Ice is good because it prevents evaporation, so that's a good thing. Um, so we're trying to put it all together into an ensemble um, and see what is the forecast going to be for the, the next, uh, we really look out four or five years. After four or five years, everything kind of reverts to the median, but uh, even looking out for a year or two is really important for us to have a real good forecast and understand what is the risk around that and what can we do to try to mitigate that risk? What tools can we use to help mitigate that risk? Uh, we have not been successful yet. It's something which, through this project and our partnership with the SAND, hopefully we can better identify what a solution might be. The initial stab in the dark that we took at it was trying to take a look at various, like, weather contracts. Um, there was a lot of those contracts sold, often tied to maybe uh, Detroit, Cleveland, something like that. Unfortunately, we can't get a good correlation. The reason being is the Great Lakes just being so, so large, evaporation really equals almost precipitation. So even though you might get a huge amount of rain, it doesn't necessarily mean, you know, uh, your generation is going to rise up all that much. Of course, if you get the rain right by Lake Erie, that's great. That's good news. But uh, when it hits the other Great Lakes, it's hard to get a contract and tie it right to our production. It's something that we're working on. We're keeping on uh, doing that. Um, just recently, the um, um, Great Lake Environmental Research Laboratory, they just completed a, a study to try to improve the forecasting process and try to bring in um, best in terms of science and also try to bring in the best uh, known impacts from uh, climate change. What's happening? Are we seeing changes? How is that affecting the forecasts? Um, the model we've been using now is the uh, Advanced Hydrologic Prediction System. It's about a 20-year-old model. So we're updating that model, and probably by next month we'll have that model, which we'll be using. Very, very important is all of this new information is being put out on the, uh, the web, so everyone has access to it. So now, maybe six months from now, when we go to the insurance community and start looking for products, they can also see, hey, this is not a forecast that the NIFA put out. It's an unbiased forecast put out by uh, the federal re uh, regulatory agencies. So we're hoping that uh, through that we might be able to get some uh, more attractive pricing in terms of looking at various uh, boutique weather products. Oftentimes, uh, the premiums that they quote you, it's just so huge that you're better off just living with that risk. So that's something that uh, is near and dear to our hearts. Again, taking a look at the Great Lakes, uh, the flow. Um, you know, we've got uh, Niagara plant over here, and then we've got the uh, St. Lawrence plant over here. And it's just a cascade. Uh, the waters go from Lake Superior uh, over to uh, Michigan Huron. Michigan Huron is really just one system. As you can see here, they have the same surface elevation, uh, different depths. And then from there, it flows to Lake Erie, through Niagara, over to the falls, down to Ontario, and finally out to sea. Several of the lakes are regulated lakes for shipping. Uh, they control the, uh, the flows of the water and the elevations, so we have to build that into our model. Take another further deep dive, peel back the onion a little bit more, and take a look at our Niagara power plant. That water that's coming off of uh, Lake Erie, we capture that water before it goes over the falls. And we have two large tunnels which go into the city of Niagara Falls and deliver the water right over here to us. The amount of that water that's flowing in over here depends on the elevation of this four bay. If this four bay is fully, fully high, there's really nothing flowing. You drop that four bay down, and then you can start bringing in all that water. Uh, we can bring in about 100,000 cubic feet of water per second through the tunnel, two tunnels, and make use of that water. We also operate under an international treaty. Um, with There's a plant, sort of a sister plant to this one, exactly opposite the river in Canada, operated by Ontario Hydro. Um, and then you have a um, treaty which says that during the daytime hours, 
from the, in a, the summertime period, 100,000 CFS of water has to flow over Niagara Falls during the daytime period for tourist reasons. At nighttime, it can drop down to 50,000. And then during non-tourist season, essentially November through April, you only have to have 50,000 flowing around the clock over the falls, and we can make use of more water. Um, so there's a water board that controls this for us in Ontario, um, and they control to make sure that we're living up to uh, the treaty and not uh, taking too much water. Issues for us uh, in the winter. Ice is a major, major issue. Um, we operate uh, ice breakers. Ontario Hydro operates ice breakers. Try to keep that water flowing. We don't want any blockages. Uh, I think we've had one blockage in the last 25 years, and shutting down Niagara for a four-day period is not something that... Uh, it's one of those real, real, real tail risks that we talk about. Uh, so we want to avoid that. But once we actually do get the water into here, we have a decision to make. We can take that water and just let it flow through a Moses plant, a main plant, generate electricity, and be fine. Or we can take that water, pump it up into this reservoir here. Then when prices are high, we take that water that we pumped up, we release it, and then we again send it back through the Moses plant. Um, when do you pump? When do you gen? That's uh, the million dollar question um, that we're looking to try to get better at modeling that. We basically have a real good high efficiency factor, almost about 90%. So we can really throttle Niagara throughout the day. The response rate is amazing. You can move that plant hundreds of megawatts very, very quickly. Um, in terms of trying to capture the price differences between the on-peak and off-peak period, you want to cycle that reservoir a lot. So during the daytime hours, you could run Niagara 2,400 megawatts. At nighttime, you could bring it right down to 800 megawatts and have all that water that's coming in just going up and having all your pumps on and then letting the remainder of the water just flow through the Moses plant here. Um, you can, the old model prior to the markets that were in was, and it made sense economically, was on a Monday morning, you have that reservoir fully full and every day you drain it down, you drain it down, pump a little back at nighttime, drain it down, pump it back at nighttime, so that by the end of the week on Friday, you've basically taken that reservoir right down to the bottom. And then you've got the next three nights to pump it back up and get back to full for the next week. Obviously, that still works, but you really have to be cognizant of what is your forecast? What is your short-term forecast? What's it saying? Are you in a heat wave that it's gonna end on Wednesday and then Thursday it's gonna drop to 70 degrees? If that's the case, you want to do everything you can to maximize that resource when prices are high and provide the benefits to the, the people of the state of New York during that time period. So we're trying to get better at bringing in that short-term forecast with the realities. Some of those additional realities are the models don't always capture everything. Uh, and what I mean by that is you'll see a price signal that the New York ISO is putting out showing whatever, high prices. So generate, generate, generate. The plant's not getting picked by the New York ISO. Why? There's transmission constraints. If I, right in this part of New York State, where the original bulk transmission system was built and designed for, you had a lot of baseload coal plants, five, 800 megawatt units. They've retired, they're no longer there. You also have a sizable injection from transmission coming from Ontario Hydro right across over here. There's a lot of transmission constraints in New York State, especially in this western New York area. Um, Niagara Power Plant is on the 345 kV system, but also some units are on a 230 kV system. A lot of the constraints are on the 115 kV system. So sometimes where we essentially back down, we can't fully, fully operate because there's not enough transmission to move that power to the load. Um, so that's a constraint that we have to try to bring into our model. When is that happening? The model would say, you know, operate, maximize when prices are high, when prices drop down, pump that water back up to Lewiston. When you get to reality, you don't quite run at 24, 2500 or something like that. You're seeing constraints on the system. Um, those constraints hopefully are being solved. Uh, the New York ISO is moving forward in terms of a fix. 
There'll probably be a few more years before that fix is fully put in place, but that's one of the uh, issues that is going on. Another issue that we have, um, this is called, we affectionately call this the North Country. This area in green is Adirondack, Adirondack Park, and then you have Catskill Park. But Adirondack Park has a lot of high peaks. You have a lot of wind, huge amount of wind. Most of the wind uh, turbines that are being sighted are being sighted right over here, this area over here, and to a certain extent, this area as well. But for this particular area here, um, we have a lot of transmission constraints as well. Um, issues that happen is wind is pretty much being sighted not because of the economic and market signal that the LBMPs are providing, that capacity prices are providing, that the ancillary service prices are providing. Wind is being sighted because of the renewable energy credits that the states have. And I think this is probably true in a lot of other parts of the country as well. Um, so what's happening is you'll get an economic signal at St. Lawrence of a negative price. So that means that we're selling so many megawatts at a negative price. How much pain can you absorb before you say, okay, back down? But St. Lawrence is a run of river plan. Backing down means spilling that water, opening up the uh, overflows, and that makes the news. Um, we have a FERC regulated license. We have a presidential permit to operate these plants because it's right on the international border. It's not something that you want to do. You talk about that reputation. The average, uh, six, you know, five o'clock news coming comes home. Why is NIPA releasing water? Why are my electric rates high? They're trying to do something to the marketplace. That's not a message that we try to, we want to try to get out there. So, what do we do about that? That needs transmission improvements. Um, this area of the state is really um, economically um, uh, hindered. Um, a lot of good jobs are no longer there. Uh, there was, used to be two aluminum smelters there, now there's only one, and even that one is only operating one of the plants, not even the other plants. Um, so the area doesn't really, you don't have the load you once did, and you don't have the, the, the transmission, is still the same transmission you had 50, 60 years ago, nothing's been added, except now you're also getting a lot of wind in this area. Um, so we're seeing a lot of constraints on the system, a lot of times negative prices, Usually the negative prices are in the real-time market, not in the day-ahead market, but we have started seeing it creep into the day-ahead market a little bit. Um, and what that means, when you see a negative price, you might get, you know, if you have an 800 megawatt plant, and that's our schedule, maybe 750 went into the day-ahead, 50 megawatts is getting sold in the real-time. Now you're selling 50 megawatts at a negative price. If for an hour or two, you can, you know, stop doing that and start spilling that water. Um, but then when you start seeing those negative prices in the day ahead market, that's really where uh, all 800 is getting a negative price, which makes no sense. The wind, they're receiving, uh, they're, you know, happy. They're still receiving those renewable energy credits. So even at a negative price, they're still having a positive cash flow. So they'll keep on uh, uh, producing energy. We kind of question that. We say, well, you got two renewable sources up there. You got hydro and you got wind. Why? And they're both, you know, from an environmental standpoint, providing the same benefit. Uh, we want to maximize so both can contribute to the system. So hopefully we've got some transmission improvements, which are on a little bit ahead of the drawing board, but not quite approved just yet. So they're probably four years out in terms of getting built. What we want to do is this area here is a 230 kV line that we have. Uh, our proposal, which is so far getting approved, is we're going to build it with 345 kV, but operate it at, at 230. And then years from now, when the system truly, truly needs the fix, and uh, the, the utility in the, the bottom half of this, we can then upgrade the whole line to 345 and try to support all this renewable development up here. Um, so, in terms of modeling this, really you want to capture in what's happening on the system, what's, um, what's going on. I think uh, someone made a reference to the, uh, the Nest thermostat. 
really what that is, is a, it's an algorithm. It's learning from you every single day. Every day you come home from work at 5 p.m., it senses you, turns on your air conditioning, turns on your heat, whatever you need. From a modeling perspective, we should start modeling these type changes we've seen. Um, wind production, wind production is high, we're seeing constraints on the system. Try to learn from that so that we can roll that forward in terms of modeling. Some of the, uh, the price risk that we face is twofold, uh, actually threefold. Capacity prices, energy prices, and uh, uh, natural gas prices. Over here we have the New York City uh, capacity prices going back from uh, 2006 right through uh, uh, May of this year. New York State is divided into um, four capacity regions. Uh, Long Island, New York City, an area called Lower Hudson Valley, and then you have everything else, which we affectionately just call the rest of state. The power plants that we have down in New York City obviously receive these type prices. Um, quite volatile, um, big difference between the winter and the summer, just as a matter of um, generation's uh, characteristics. Typically in the winter, generators can produce a bit more than they can in the hot summertime. Uh, so you tend to have more uh, generation in the winter, which results in lower prices. What moves these prices is not so much um, the fundamentals of natural gas prices. It's not so much the fundamentals of load. It's really the fundamentals of the system itself. So two examples, uh, back in the 2010 period when prices were sitting at about maybe less than a dollar, uh, the Paletti power plant retired. An 885 megawatt unit comes offline. Prices just jumped right upwards to almost uh, $7. Um, the market responded. The following winter, I guess a lot of units said, you know, uh, it came back down to prices. Over in 2012, another example, um, the Bayonne Energy Center um, came online, threw 500 megawatts onto the system that crashed prices and brought prices right down. So that's the dynamics of it. What we're seeing is the marketplace is becoming much more challenging. It's no longer just a, you know, we operate, uh, it used to be the New York Power Pool, now it's the New York Independent System Operator. We used to have a New York type of uh, uh, view. But competition is a good thing, but you have to be aware of that. How's that impacted? Bayonne Energy Center, for example, it's geographically located in New Jersey. It's electrically connected right into New York City. So, and its access to natural gas is no longer the New York City Transco Zone 6 price, they were probably able to access a different pipeline and uh, get better pricing. Uh, the cost to build is probably less, so they're taking advantage of it. The other two components of price is uh, natural gas prices and energy prices. What we're looking at here is uh, New York City Zone J. New York State on the energy side, they've divided the state into zones A through uh, K. Zone J being the New York City area. We go back to 2008, we saw our LBMPs uh, approaching $80, um, sticking around 80 bucks, and then gradually they came down. Um, we have the polar vortex period here of 2014, um, where prices got up around $180. On the same, looking at the, uh, the right side of the uh, graph, we take a look at uh, what's happening with the natural gas prices. And you can see that, that real close, close core, um, um, how well they correlated to each other, those two prices. Uh, you can see how natural gas prices were, you know, super high, um, maybe $15, $20. We hit a couple of peaks of, uh, you know, $20, $25. Then we got into that uh, uh, vortex period where prices were even much, much higher. Um, and you can see the energy prices, zone J prices, follow that same shape. What's nice is natural gas, very, very liquid, great marketplace. If I want to hedge something going out a couple of years, I've got solid pricing out there. I've got solid uh, counterparties I can do business with. Trying to do energy deals, especially for Zone J, not as liquid. You know, in the short term, going out a year or two, there's still some strength in the marketplace there, but not as much as natural gas. And certainly, if you want to go out four years, you start uh, paying a bit of a premium because there's not enough participants. 
As I said, New York has zones A through K scattered throughout the state. We have power plants located everywhere. Um, in terms of the financial markets, really it's zones A, uh, G, and J. Those are the three primary ones that people trade on and write contracts for. You can get maybe some done in C, you can get some done in uh, F, but you gotta struggle a little bit, you gotta see where the market is. It's not always there. Uh, one of the fundamentals that we learned is when we started in this business, maybe four or five years ago, we were using VAR as our, um, as our tool to measure risk. The problem that we see with VAR is it was developed by the fan financial community, and they're largely moving you know, cash, currency. And the theory behind VAR is within whatever, one day holding period or five day holding period, if there's a problem, you can unwind your business and get out of that in that time frame. For the electric markets and for us in terms of managing risk using VAR, what we kind of see as an issue is can you unwind a thousand megawatts in two days? You're gonna take a major, major haircut on something like that, especially in these kind of markets. So it's the liquidity is a, a strong thing for us. For that reason, we're largely moving to a, um, a gross margin at risk or even a cash flow at risk is something we're looking at. Um, the risk that we see on the horizon, which we're starting to feel you know, now, is with renewables. This is just looking at the, the wind. Um, the, uh, the green dots represent pretty much where we are, we're at today. Um, 1,800 megawatts of installed wind on a system, a lot in the uh, northern New York, a lot here in the western New York, and unfortunately, wind locates where they're getting the fuel. Where the fuel is, is this area and this area, so they're locating there. Transmission system wasn't built and designed to support that. As we all know, the transmission system was built and designed with a regulated model in place. You base load power plants next to the lakes to get the cooling water, but wind is locating where they can get the most uh, availability from. Um, if we look at the blue dot of what's planned, what that is, all the, what I mean by planned, these are units which have submitted their, uh, their generation notices to New York ISO they're in the processes of getting studied. They're in the process of moving through the uh, in, uh, interconnection queue to become uh, installed. You get 4,000 megawatts, uh, and that could even grow even more. And I'm not even moving on solar. A lot of the solar is behind the meter in New York State, so now you're relying on those forecasts that we're getting from the local transmission owners of how much solar is on the system. Um, so load growth is really not part of our discussion anymore. Um, you know, and you, we're, we're seeing th three 90 degree days and we're not seeing the bump you used to see like yeah, we, you know, historical. Um, so where does this put us in terms of hedging? Um, you know, a basic graph of, you know, what are you trying to do with hedging? We're really just trying to uh, manage to a number. Um, being a public authority, you know, around this time of the year, we do our forecast. We say, what is our net income gonna be for the upcoming year? Based on our net, in, net, uh, net income, the trustees give the approval on it. They put together a spending plan. We're not for profit. If we say we're gonna make 100 million, trustees are gonna spend 100 million. Simple. If we happen to make more money, well, if we knew that ahead of time, we probably could have planned some projects a little bit better than what we did. And also, being a state authority, if you made some extra money, the state's just gonna take it from you. Um, the other side, the bad side, is what if you don't make 100, you make something a lot less. Well, you're committed to funding these $100 million projects, but you don't have the revenue coming in. And yeah, you could probably get by a year or two, you know, with some struggles and some belt tightening and uh, all those ugly things that we don't like to work on, but it's a part of the equation. But you want to try like, you know, minimize that. In terms of looking at the range of possible outcomes, you know, we have the 5%, 95%, uh, whatever the statistical range that we want to look at is in terms of possible outcomes. Um, by putting in a good hedging program, you can kind of reduce those outcomes. Um, if you're on the pure generation side of the business, yeah, you're giving up something. You know, it's, that's the cost of hedging. That's the cost that we give up here. Um, but you're protecting that downside. If you're on the customer side, and we serve customers, like I said, throughout the state, what they're concerned about is 
you know, high prices. They don't want to do that. They, they've set a budget over here. Uh, they can ab maybe absorb this, but they can't do this. And they said, no, no, no. Put, me, put a hedging program in place that keeps my total cost for the year, my cost of service within a certain constraint and manage to do that. And yes, I understand by doing that, uh, we could give up if prices drop really, really low and uh, fracking is, you know, and everything else happens. Um, when we look at our portfolio, we usually look out four years into the future. Um, I'm just showing three years here. But really, we're looking at our total energy margin. Um, we're looking at um, what we refer to as our merchant energy margin. That's sales over and above our uh, retail load, our, uh, our requirements that we have to serve. When you have lots of hydro, you have much more merchant income. Take a look at where's our expected value, how high can it go, how low can it go. Then we sit down with finance. We say, what point you know, do you cry wolf? What point would this be a problem for you? If we were to hit this 10%, this uh, low point here, these 10 percentiles, is that a problem? One thing we came up with in terms of talking with finance and trying to get to that number and putting a, a value on it, how low can you go, is I mentioned we uh, have a lot of bonds. Um, and one of the metrics that gets reported on a monthly basis to our trustees is what is our, um, our debt service coverage ratio, our, if you're our fixed, fixed charge coverage ratio. It shall not go below 2.0. If it does, the trustees want to be made aware of this, of what's happening. Our financial community, the people who uh, rate our bonds, they, um, they can pretty much tolerate down to about 1.75. Once it gets around there, they're going to ding us on our bonds and our ratings. Um, so instead of being double A or A minus, we'll take a hit. That's not a good thing. That means higher interest rates, higher costs for everybody. So we took that conversion from the uh, fixed charge coverage ratio, converted that into dollars. And then from there, we can then identify what is our limit here. We do not want to go to that limit. And we want to put in place a structured program which will prevent us from getting to that limit and then you monitor over time. So that's kind of today. Um, in looking at our overall portfolio, um, we recognize our gross margin is variable. It's driven by many, many factors. Again, we're looking at, I, I'm showing three years, we're really looking four years into the future. Um, we're breaking it out into the various buckets. Uh, so we've got the energy bucket, we've got the capacity budget uh, bucket. Um, there's also uh, the ancillaries, which are bringing in revenues for us. And then you want to tie it all together. Um, right now, this is all being done you know, on Excel, on various programs, and tying it together. I'm not sure if it's really being tied together 100% correctly. So that's one thing which we're working with Ascend on, is to get better at this model. But the, in terms of the energy, there's more to it than just plain energy. There's other pieces. Uh, those pieces are the hydrovolumetric risk, uh, which we had talked about earlier. How much water are you going to have? How much generation can you get from that? Then you have your price risk in terms of the energy, largely a function of where natural gas prices might be in time in terms of what your LBMPs will be. Spark spread for our fossil units. Uh, you know, you're buying the gas, you're selling the power. And hopefully our units are efficient. The New York ISO model, as, all, as most models, are just driving you towards efficiency, efficiency, getting that heat rate as low as possible. Uh, used to be a 7.5 was a good number, now we're down to 6.8 values. So that's spark spread, trying to capture that. The, the last one, though, is an interesting one. Uh, it's the basis risk. We're selling uh, the energy from our power plants right at the generator bus. As I said, the financial markets um, price the energy on zones A through K, or you know, the popular ones, which are A, G, you know, J. Niagara Power Plant is located within Zone A. Historically, the price from our generated bus to Zone A correlated pretty darn good, you know, 90, 94%. So that was, that was pretty good. But with these transmission constraints that we've seen, the correlations really drop off. So we got basis risk on that one. Um, this is the one that can keep you up at nighttime. You have a hedge in place um, regarding against low power prices. Power prices go upwards, our hedges out of the money. 
Okay, I can explain that if it's happening. But you always say, well, that's what a hedge is doing, but the physical asset is selling at those high prices. So, you know, it's not as bad as you think, and we have an out of market uh, settlement that we're paying out on the hedge, but on our physical asset, we are bringing in some revenue. But with that basis risk, that may not happen. And what I mean is, zone A prices could be up high, and our bus prices could be low. <laughs> so we're not even getting that revenue in, and we're paying out on the head, so it's getting hit twice. So that's some of the issues that we try to uh, wrestle with. Um, like I said, it's really transmission dependent in terms of if we can get more transmission built, if we can get uh, changes in the modeling in terms of um, the famous ABB uh, security constrained unit commitment that New York ISO has in terms of how you're modeling your assets, how you're modeling all your generation, how you're monitoring, uh, you know, the voltage support, supporting reliability, um, whether or not any other plants are up there. Um, so that's a, a big one for us. Then you have the capacity, and we're just looking at what is the capacity price is doing to us. Um, New York has a, um, a demand curve, which essentially says, and it recognizes that if you have more capacity than, you, than is needed to support your one day and 10 year LOLE violation, a capacity still has some value and some benefits. So, but it declines. So if you have 100%, yeah, it's worth a lot, but then it goes out to maybe 112%. At 112%, we say, no, it's worth zero. So you have a declining demand curve, all based on the supply and demand of what your loads are and how much generation you have. Uh, and that can fluctuate uh, wildly, in fact. So we want to look at uh, where we're at with that one. New York has uh, a lot of interesting things going on. We have uh, what's called a ZEC program. Just if uh, you thought you had your acronyms down, a new one came along. Zero emission credit. I think uh, Indiana, a few other states are looking at it, uh, Illinois perhaps. But basically, you're saying th the nuclear power plants are saying they can't make it in this marketplace. They're going to leave and retire. So if you have a goal of a certain emissions uh, goal in mind, you want to be 50% or 30% by some year in the future, losing those nuclear plants will make it real challenging to try to meet those uh, goals. Because what's going to make up the difference will probably be new combined cycles, which are efficient in uh, low emissions, but they're not as low as nuclear. Um, so you want to keep those nuclear plants. So it came up with the idea of these zero emission credits that all ratepayers in the state would have to pay to then support these power plants located upstate New York and keep them operational. So, and that kind of, you know, you have a forecast, you see these plants, you know they're going to retire, so you forecast it in of prices are going to be high because you're losing all this generation, and then the ZEC program comes along, and there's so much for our forecast. So, kind of things we try to wrestle with. Uh, in terms of putting this all together, uh, see me on November 18th. <laughs> um, what we want to try to do is develop a model which looks at all of the revenue sources, brings them together in one, takes all of our generation, and then rolls it up in terms of one portfolio and sees how we're doing. Um, we can do rather quick what-if analyses. What if those 4,000 megawatts of wind come onto the system? What might it do to us? We have a resource planning group that can get into the weeds in terms of the transmission constraints and how much of that wind will be deliverable. We'll understand what the capacity impacts might be, but you can very quickly can see what does that do to us and where do we want to be as an organization. Uh, we can set our budgets more closely in terms of the water and uh, the volumetric risk we face. We can better understand what is that forecast going to be. Um, can we get in front of the curve? And right now we're at very, very high levels, um, extremely high, like uh, top 5% uh, ever recorded. So we know to, just based on you know, averaging, it's only got one way to go, and that's go, to go down. But we want to try to forecast it if it does start to move down uh, and try to capture that and capture that volumetric risk that we carry every single day. And then you can start saying, once you understand what that risk is, you can really have a good discussion with how do you want to, uh, what do you want to do about it? What are the products out there? T let's take a look at the weather contracts. Let's take a look at insurance contracts. What does it do? Um, what is that premium? Is it worth to spend a premium or should I just wear that w risk? You can really have that educated decision. So that's something that we're trying to bring together here. We're also trying to understand the role of renewables. What's that doing? And what I mean by that, not so much the impact on the energy prices, but 
we know that other products are going to be needed or strengthened, such as the ancillary products, your ramping. Um, I think many areas have a, a downward ramping and an upward ramping for uh, regulation, up, uh, up reg, down reg. New York doesn't have, we just have one. So there probably would be some changes needed in the ancillary markets to better support this growth in renewables. Studies have been shown that if we were to get to this huge, crazy number of four or five, 10,000 megawatts of renewables, the installed reserve margin, instead of being 18%, is going to be around 40 to 50%. And that's, that's, you know, that's not a very good market at that point. Um, so we want to try to understand what other products are needed. Once we understand that, then we can start talking to our engineers and our planners and say, okay, what can you do to have your generator offer instead of a 30-minute product, offer a 10-minute spin product? What does it take to do that? What's the wear and tear on a unit by start stops this much? Because we're going to be chasing this price. Um, the VOM cost, what is that value? Let's bring that value, the VOM cost, into our model to understand what is it doing to the overall portfolio. Um, I can put my hat on of uh, energy resource management and say, yes, we sold these units, we made this amount of profit and this much. And then the generation side, they're crying because now the units are beat up, they've got long-term outages, they've got to fix the equipment, it's costing me a lot of money. So we've got to find that balance between us and understand what is that variable operating cost and bring that into our model so we can better uh, operate our units and try to, what we call is optimizing units. Um, so that's what I wanted to talk to you guys about. Thank you very much for listening. I appreciated some of the discussions earlier. I want to have some sidebar conversations with some of the hydro people and, and how you guys are dealing with the same issues that we face. Thank you.